would see a drift, that we would see evidence for a changing electromagnetic fine structure constant. So we are not seeing any such evidence and the limits by now are even smaller than uh, what one could derive from these two measurements. Uh, right now we have a new team, a PhD student Christian Pache and three postdocs who are uh, work looking again at this transition and they have made so many improvements that now we really have a better measurement. We now reach an uncertainty of 3.8 times 10 to the minus 15, at least the preliminary result. So if you look at the history, how the uncertainty improved over time, <coughs> we see that we are still progressing on this exponential slope. Of course, one can ask how, how much farther can that go on? And I think it can go on for quite a while because this last November <coughs> we implemented a new detector for the excited 2S atoms based on essentially collecting Lyman alpha photons over a solid angle of 4 pi surrounding the detection region with a graphite cylinder and uh, looking at photoelectrons with the channel drawn. And the improvement in signal is so dramatic that now we can get good statistics in much shorter time. We can afford to work at lower laser intensity and we can implement velocity selective detection by quenching the atoms with a blue laser beam. And so I'm quite confident that we, that say 16 digit uncertainty of 10 to the minus 16 is within reach. Of course, uh, in order to measure to 10 to the minus 16, you need a good reference. And the cesium atomic clocks are not good enough. So we need to rely on optical clocks. And we will be able to do so with the help of a fiber link. We have a, a link of telecommunications fibers with erbium amplifiers in between that allows us to transfer optical reference frequencies across Germany over 855 kilometers fiber link from the physikalisch technische Bundesanstalt, our metrology lab, to our laboratory in Garching and at the PDB people are working on optical clocks. Of course here we need to worry about the height difference. The height difference between the two labs amounts to a gravitational redshift of 4.4 times 10 to the minus 14. So we need to take that into account, but it should be possible. And it will be interesting to see what, how far one can go. Uh, these precise measurements, of course, are some kind of sports. You like to see how far you can push them. But it's, it may also open uh, the possibility for intriguing questions. Uh, people are now learning how to capture anti-hydrogen, antimatter made up of an antiproton and a positron. And eventually, one will learn how to do spectroscopy of antihydrogen. And so, uh, then by measuring the frequencies very well, maybe we can discover some conceivable differences between matter and antimatter. But let's go back to our tree here. So we looked at uh, frequency measurement, optical clocks. Uh, clocks have evolved over the ages from the sundial to the modern cesium clock and often major improvements were achieved by going to a faster pendulum, to a faster oscillator from say the grandfather clock with one hertz to the quartz clock with 32 kilohertz to the cesium clock with nine billion cycles per second. And now by using as a pendulum atoms or ions that oscillate with the frequency of light, we slice time into a still 100,000 times finer interval. And so conceivably, eventually we will have clocks that can be 100,000 times better than our best current cesium clocks. And uh, there are different approaches. You can use a single trapped ion uh, so th that you can be sure there are no collisions. Of course, you don't have much signal, so one needs to average over quite some while. Or one can look at cold neutral atoms, you could have a hundred thousand or a million of these atoms at once kept 
each in its own optical cage, in an optical lattice. And so one has to see which is the most practical approach. But uh, if you look at what has already been achieved, uh, in blue we see how the accuracy of cesium clocks has improved since the 1970s, and in green the progress with optical clocks. And so right now the best optical clocks are already reaching 10 to the minus 18 territory. And just this last year there was an article in Science for about the comparison of two optical clocks where you could uh, sh uh, see a gravitational redshift if the two clocks are only 10 centimeter differing in height in Boulder, Colorado. So uh, eventually such clocks might be pushed to 10 to minus 20, so then tiny variations in gravitational potential would be measurable. And one could of course worry that this is totally impractical. On the other hand, maybe we can learn something from tiny changes in gravitational potential, and maybe they will become interesting instruments to explore uh, geophysics, for instance. And of course, there are many good reasons why better clocks are important uh, for clock synchronization over large distances, for radio astronomy, for satellite navigation, for telecommunications, for network synchronization, and so on. And of course, uh, for us in fundamental science, it opens new possibilities for tests of special and general relativity. And also we can pursue this intriguing question whether fundamental constants are really constant or maybe slowly changing with time. Let's look at a totally different example. Uh, the frequency comb behaves as if he had a million lasers at once. Can we use these million laser frequencies at once to look at broadband complex spectra? And the answer is yes, and indeed it's quite intriguing. Of course, a highly multiplex spectroscopy is nothing new. People have performed Fourier spectroscopy since the 50s, where you in essence, have a Michelson interferometer, a white light source, a traveling arm Michelson interferometer. You send the output of this Michelson interferometer through an absorbing sample, say a gas, and with a detector, you look at the autocorrelation function. And a computer that calculates the Fourier transform gives you the spectrum. Now, consider to implement such a Fourier spectrometer without moving parts by taking two frequency comb generators operating at two slightly different repetition frequencies. Uh, so one of the pulse strains will behave as if it had been reflected of a moving mirror, as if we had imparted a Doppler shift from a moving mirror. We still uh, can do the same as we always did. We send the slides, for example, at a detector, take a computer to calculate the uh, Fourier transform, and one gets uh, first an interferogram, and then after you calculate the transform, you get a spectrum. So here is an example for such a spectrum. It's a vibrational band in <coughs> acetylene uh, recorded with two erbium doped fiber frequency comb oscillators. And it's nothing special as far as Fourier transform spectroscopy goes, except that in order to record such a spectrum with a conventional Fourier spectrometer with this resolution, you would need several minutes of recording time. And this is a spectrum that has been recorded in a measurement time of only 42 microseconds. Uh, you gain for several reasons. You gain because we are not using incoherent light, but laser light. But also we gain because we can simulate moving mirror velocities that you could not implement in practice. By just turning a knob and changing the repetition frequency, I could simulate a Michelson interferometer where the mirror travels at 10 kilometers per second. And, and so that allows me to very much shorten the recording time 
And if you can record spectra much faster,